<clears throat> okay, so uh, today uh, is the birthday of Max Abramovitz. Uh, he was born on, uh, on uh, May 22nd, 23rd, 1908. This was the man, <clears throat> uh, uh, an important architect who worked together with Wallace Harrison, uh, and uh, they built many, many buildings and some uh, very important buildings. Uh, let's, uh, let's read a little bit about him. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy birthday, Mr. Abramovitz. So Max Abramovitz, uh, born as you can see, May 23rd, 1908, one, 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 one uh, was an American architect. He was best known for his work with the New York City firm Harrison and Abramovitz. Abramovitz was the son of Romanian Jewish immigrant parents. He graduated in 1929 from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, School of Architecture. While a junior at Illinois, Abramovitz was a member of the Tau Web Epsilon Psi Fraternity. He later received an MS from Columbia University's Architecture School in 1931. He also was the recipient of a two-year fellowship at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris before returning to the United States and becoming partners with Wallace Harrison from 1941 to 1976. So for 35 years, he worked uh, in this important architectural firm. In 1961, he was an invited resident <coughs> of the, uh, of the uh, American Academy in Rome. Abramovitz died in September 2004 in uh, Pound Ridge, uh, New York, at the age of 96. His drawings and archives are held by the Avery, Avery Architectural and Fine Arts Library at Columbia University. Abramovitz also received an honorary doctorate in fine arts from the University of Illinois in 1970. Abramovitz was a friend, a student of Brandeis University President Abram Sakhar, who recruited him to work on his new campus. For 30 years, Abramovitz oversaw university planning, was a university fellow, and served on its board of overseers and the Creative Arts Commission. Abramovitz designed the vast majority of buildings on the Brandeis campus during the mid-1950s, including the three chapels, Schlossberg Music Center, Pierman Hall, and the Rose Art Museum, all built between 1955 and 1961. So in six years, we are going to see them. The three chapels at Brandeis University. Here they are. Um, interesting idea to have three small chapels in close proximity. I never saw something like this before, but I think it's a it's an interesting idea, a, a cluster of small, uh, small chapels built by Abramovitz um, at uh, Brandeis University. Not bad. Now, the Slosberg Music Center, also at the same university, here it is. So these were built in the 1950s, about 70 years ago. <clears throat> the Perman uh, Hall also at Brandeis University. <clears throat> the universities in the United States, unless they are within a city, but most of them are outside of cities, they are like, uh, you know, uh, towns in themselves. They have everything there, you know, it's, it's a uh, protected world. In fact, some critics uh, said that um, this is not necessarily good because the, the students are far away from the misery of uh, uh, often the misery of urban life, and they 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 get uh, the wrong ideas about uh, you know what what a city is, what a town is, 
because uh, these universities are um, privileged places. You know, you just study, learn, uh, trees around you and so on. There are very few universities that are actually part of cities like Columbia University, but that there are qualities, although there are difficulties because you know the city was the the city surrounds the university and the city is immersed the the city life uh, is um, intersecting with the students life not the same here you see it's just nature around just forest it is beautiful but uh, it's an encouragement towards entertaining illusions about capitalism and who knows what else the Rouse Art Museum, part of the same university, these universities, they have a lot of money. Most of them have uh, very fine art museums with great collections and so on. So this was built also by Mr. Max Abramovitz in the 50s. I mean, the works you see now are works which are mentioned uh, on the web as being um, as belonging to him, although he worked in the firm Harrison Abramovitz. But they worked on some very important, um, you know, public works. Maybe if there is time after I present Abramovitz, I could also present um, Wallace. So we see. I'm absolutely sure Abramovitz and the Wallace um, collaborated on some projects, otherwise their firm could not have functioned just like this. One doing his works and the other one doing his works. Anyway, these are the uh, images from the inside of the museum. Uh, he's not a uh, you know, very spectacular architect most of the time, but he's able to, he was able to uh, you know, uh, build uh, using uh, a modernistic language uh, correctly, and uh, here and there he took some risks. So <clears throat> now we are going to look at three buildings that he built for the University of Illinois at Urban Champaign. Uh, where he actually studied, including the 1963 State Farm Center, formerly uh, Assembly Hall, at its time the world's largest edge supported dome, which is 400 feet, this is about 130 meters in diameters, and rises 128 feet, that's about, I don't know, 45 uh, feet uh, above the uh, meters above the floor. The 1969 Craner uh, Center for the Performing Arts and the Hillel Building. I just want to say you here uh, from this university, exactly this university, University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. I received some years ago when I launched the competition, a house for Lady Gaga. A whole atelier, a whole class, so to speak, sent their works. The students in the last year of study, and you can see them on the on the website ecarch.us. Very interesting uh, conceptual works. State Farm Center. This was built by, uh, and as a, you know, you remember the dimensions. It's huge, uh, and <clears throat> it's supported only at the edge, at the periphery. It, it, it was, as it was mentioned, uh, I don't know if it's possible, it's not any longer, but at the time when it was built, it was the, the largest uh, dome structure that was supported only at the periphery. Uh, great, uh, great engineering. And I think it, it stands the, the test of time, you know. Uh, it, it's still uh, impressive, you know, considering uh, Considering uh, its dimensions and uh, its, um, you know, uh, even aesthetically, I think it's 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 a remarkable work, and uh, you can see clearly here that uh, you know it's 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 giant. It is a giant building, built by uh, Max uh, Abramovitz. <clears throat> the, um, uh, it received some renovations, of course, from you know seventy years or so but of life, but it, st it still stands and its structure is as, uh, as amazing as it was then. So this is in Chicago. Well, the University of Illinois Champaign in Chicago. 
he was we should remember he was born in Chicago in 1908 on May 23rd. It has it had various names. Now it is called State Farm Center. I, I don't know why why this name, but anyway, that's how it is called. From what I read, Abramovich took works from within the firm and he was developing them by himself. Wallace did the same thing, but since they signed the projects together as the firm Harrison Abramovich, they didn't work individually. I imagine they consulted each other and you know they, they uh, uh, agreed uh, with the works that uh, their firm, their firm uh, put out. Okay, now the Kranner Center for the Performing Arts, also by him. This also, I would say, uh, you know, uh, good work, you know, uh, okay, maybe the word decent would, uh, would be usable, but, uh, you know, it was built and uh, it, it's not a very, very adventurous architecture, but it's not one without some qualities. Without doubt, Max Abramovitz, um, you know, had talent and uh, he was a serious architect. In fact, together with Wallace Harrison, they were part of the team that designed the United Nations building where there were also consultants, uh, Le Corbusier, Oscar Niemeyer. Well, in fact, more than consultants. In fact, Le Corbusier complained that uh, Apparently, you know, the final work, the one that was built, included work, uh, including, uh, included some, uh, you know, some ideas he put forward. But anyway, uh, the work, I mean, Harrison Abramovitz are considered part of the team. In fact, the leading part of the team that built the, uh, the United Nations building. But even this building, I mean, you look again at the ceiling, the ceiling is uh, sculptural, is, is, he was a good architect, Max Abramovitz. Here he is on the left with some uh, donors, I imagine, you know, some uh, philanthropists, you know, they, they look a little bit uh, morose and uh, melancholy, but uh, they put the money. The architect looks sharp and he indeed must have been sharp you know, to uh, handle such big commissions. Okay, now the Phoenix Life Insurance Company building in Hartford, Connecticut, 1963. Um, so, you know, uh, 60 years ago. Uh, okay, this kind of, uh, you know, certain world doesn't move me and maybe doesn't move you either a lot these days, but, but most skyscrapers are a bit like this. At least this one has an interesting shape in the plan. And uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's structurally sound and it, it, it has a little bit of, you know, otherness because of the shape uh, in plan and it works and it was built. And I imagine those people in the conference room right here have the time of their life, uh, you know, debating uh, how to make a, an even bigger profit. During the construction, these Americans at that time, you know, there was optimism in the 60s, you know, they built anything, you know, they, they, the country had optimism, had the money, had the economic power and, um, there was no uh, melancholia at that time. Now, now the temple of uh, sacred building, so to speak, the temple Beth Zion, uh, Zion in Buffalo, New York, 1967. Um, it's a valued uh, building. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's considered highly in the field of architecture, an important uh, North American artist contributed with artworks here, uh, Ben Shan. Uh, here it is, this was done the stained glass window by him.
Max Abramovitz from the firm Harrison Abramovitz. They both had uh, connections and relations. Uh, Abramovitz uh, built them themselves, himself, I would say, but uh, Harrison, he was connected uh, you know, family relations with the Rockefeller family. So of course they had, uh, they had great commissions. Uh, when Rockefeller was the governor of, uh, of, uh, of, of the state of New York. So this is this temple, this particular temple that Max Abramovitz built, a Jewish temple. It's good, it's good, it's well built. The University of Iowa Museum of Art. Uh, here I only have this model uh, because um, I couldn't find in the Hari, I prepared this material, uh, um, the right pictures for some reason. So I just included, uh, uh, you know, the initial phase of the fine arts complex, University of Iowa Museum of Art, which he built. The International Affairs Building at Columbia University, New York, 1970. We remember he also received a master in science in architecture from Columbia University. So. You know, I'm sure he had uh, the, the ability to uh, leave a good impression and, uh, you know, he got awarded with uh, commissions. But this was a very successful architecture practice, Wallace um, Harrison Abramovitz. I always have troubles with Wallace Harrison because I have to think which one is the first name and which one is the family name. U.S. Steel Tower, also known as the U.S. X Tower in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, 1970. I like it, you know, uh, black as it is, and uh, it is uh, it is impressive. And the tower, it is. There is no question about it. There is no um, ambiguity. Domineering. But because of that blackness, you know, the blackness could also express uh, some, some, some pessimism. So while the tower is an optimistic structure by uh, itself, blackness could uh, represent something in a way paradoxically to make it less domineering. Uh, this is my, uh, my perception, perception of things. Maybe I'm wrong, but... Uh, because a tower of these dimensions could be very overwhelming, but be, because it is black, there is something ominous about it. And uh, paradoxically, I think it becomes a little bit less oppressive. I, I could be wrong, but it's a, it's a fine, it's a very fine building that uh, Max Abramovitz uh, built. If an architect would have built just this building all his life, you know, he could have said, I left something behind. But he, he built many other buildings. National City Tower in Louisville, 1972, uh, is the one in the center. Here it is. Well, this one more conventional somehow. Um, as he advanced in age, uh, and he also got separated from Wallace Harrison, the firm of Wallace Harrison uh, dissolved in 1976, but he died in 2004. So, uh, you know, for other 28 years, of course, he died in 96. So let's say for 10, 15 years, he didn't work any longer, but for a number of years, he worked together in association with other architects. Now he even built in Paris. This I found out with surprise, the Tour Gan, Gan uh, La Défense in Paris, 1974, here it is. Of course, there are more interesting skyscrapers now than this one, but uh, at that time when it was built, I think it meant something because Paris didn't have too many tall buildings. I mean, there was a Tower Montparnasse, but, but uh, besides that, only at La Défense. Now all kinds of towers sprang, you know, but this is the tower still, I think, has a certain distinctiveness uh, is the tower by uh, Max Abramovitz or, uh, you know, Harrison Abramovitz. The Learning Research and Development Center building at the University of Pennsylvania, 1974. 
no pictures, one Seagate, Toledo, Toledo, uh, Toledo, Ohio, 1982. He began to work at that time with this group, this firm called Abramovitz, Harris, and Kingsland. And we are going to see at the end of this short presentation a few buildings they built in this formation. Again, Abramovitz, Harris, Kingsland, Kingsland. I don't know in what year, I think in 1980 something. Uh, uh, Wallace Harrison died. An office building with a lot of glass. That's it. I am not very fond of these kind of buildings, but I guess they function. And uh, if this building was in Europe, it would have been very, very noticeable and very, very admired. But in the United States, they have so many such buildings that uh, you know, uh, it's not uh, something that shocks you in, in any way. Another building in Columbus, Ohio, 1983, in that the same office, Abramovitz, Harris, and Kingsland, another tower. And I still think even this one is not so banal as it, it might first appear. So this is in Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio, in which one day I had the chance by misfortune actually to walk for a few miles on the gray Grand Avenue. And I had I, I, I saw so much poverty, so much incredible poverty. And Columbus is the capital of Ohio. You know, no one on the streets except a drunk, per, a drunk, a drunken person, a drunk person, uh, or uh, someone with, you know, with drugs, uh, broken windows, and so on for miles and miles, and just cars running, running, running. Very, very depressing. Uh, I just, uh, it's, it, it was apocalyptic, actually. Anyway. This tower was downtown, built downtown, but uh, Columbus has a, a fine uh, uh, architecture school, the Ohio State University. Uh, there are some progressive minds there. Um, okay, Capitol Square, again in Columbus, 1984, the same firm. Uh, it doesn't impress me and it probably doesn't impress you, but Abramovich was there. Of course, it's this building here. Maybe he built this one too. I don't know. It kind of looks a little bit similar. Americans are very good at building skyscrapers, as you probably imagine. They can build in two months a skyscraper, which in Frankfurt, in Germany, would need two years. And uh, <laughs> I think with this, I said everything about skyscrapers and, the, and the, the, the abilities of the North Americans to build skyscrapers. Now this, uh, I don't know how to highlight, here is a library, a new home for the Radcliffe College Library at Harvard. With this, I end this short presentation. And maybe if you allow me, then very quickly, we'll also go through the works of his partner, which is very possible to some works he contributed to because they, they work together. Harrison Abramovitz. In fact, this work I also show uh, in, the, in the presentation about Wallace Harrison. Uh, so this, is, uh, this was built at, uh, at Harvard, and I think it's, it's, it's a good building, maybe not uh, sufficiently fluid for our time, but uh, you know, very comfortable inside and uh, outside, uh, you know, moderately, moderately interesting. Harvard Property uh, Information Resource Center, as it is called now. Okay, and now if you want, uh, I can quickly, uh, since we, we take this occasion, I will show you the, the works of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the same firm. It's very possible that some buildings, but it was very, very hard to, to identify which ones were done by his partner and which ones by him. So. Quickly, we'll talk about his partner, Wallace Harrison. So why do I do this? Because 
Max Abramovitz was the par partner of Wallace Harrison for 35 years. And they built some very interesting works. The ones I showed initially, I identified as being uh, probably uh, built mainly or conceived mainly by Max Abramovitz. But it's, I'm absolutely sure some of the works I show now also had uh, the input of uh, Max Abramovitz, at least to an extent. So Wallace Kerman Harrison was an American architect. He was older than, uh, than um, Max Abramovitz. He was born in 1895. So he was 13 years uh, older than uh, Max Abramovitz. And initially Max Abramovitz started to work for him. And uh, you know, in a, a few years, he became a partner. This says something about Max Abramovitz. So uh, he started his professional career. It's a little bit enigmatic if Wallace Harrison studied architecture and for how long, if he received a diploma or not, I couldn't find out, uh, you know, convincing information about this. But Harrison started his, prof you see, it starts directly uh, into the professional career. It is almost says nothing about his education. Harrison started his professional career with a firm of Corbet, Harrison and McMurray, participating in the construction of Rockefeller Center. And uh, Abramovitz was there too later. He's best known for executing large public projects in New York City and upstate New York. Many of them a result of his long and fruitful personal relationship with Nelson Rockefeller, for whom he served as an advisor. Not, now that is a dream job. And he was related uh, through a family liaison to Nelson Rockefeller. I mean, you know, with such a, uh, you know, a family member, uh, you know, anything be becomes possible. It's like being, you know, the cousin of an Egyptian pharaoh. Harrison's work in the mid 20th century comprised large modernist public projects and office building. As a young man, Harrison took classes in engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute and in architecture, the Boston Architectural Club. I, I don't know if the Boston Architectural Club could qualify as an architecture school. I never heard of it. And then he studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in the early 20s and won the Roche Traveling Scholarship in 1922. He worked for McKee, and White, an important, um, you know, kind of neoclassical uh, American uh, architecture firm and Bertram Brothers nor from 1916 to 1923 and later formed a series of architectural partnerships, the main one being with uh, Abramovitz. Harrison participated with the architectural teams involved in the construction of Rockefeller Center in New York City, completed in 1939. Abramovitz became a partner of the firm Harrison Abramovitz in 1941, so two years later. His brother-in-law was married to John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s daughter. So this explains you know, the, the privilege he had of incredible commissions. And Harrison served as a designer and architectural advisor for Nelson Rockefeller, notably in the years when Rockefeller was a governor of New York. Not bad. In 1941, Harrison joined with Max Abramovitz. I repeat, uh, born from uh, two Romanian uh, Jewish emigres, to form the firm of Harrison and Abramovitz. In partnership with Abramovitz, Harrison designed scores of university and corporate buildings, including the Time and Life, 1959, and in 1959, already Abramovitz uh, worked with him for 14 years. And Soconi Mobile, 1956, both designated New York City landmarks. He made it to the cover of a page uh, of, of the Time magazine. Uh, Abramovitz didn't yet, but. So among Harrison's most noted projects are the Metropolitan Opera House at the Lincoln Center, for the performing arts and the Empire State Plaza in Albany. He also served as director of planning on the United Nations complex, which was built on slaughterhouse property contributed by the Rockefeller family. Max Abramovitz was the deputy director of planning and the United Nations complex. 
The Rockefellers owned the Tudor City apartment, uh, apartments across First Avenue. Harrison also developed the design for the Pershing Memorial in Washington, referred to as Par Pershing Park and home to the National World War Memorial. In addition to his architectural work, Harrison served as a master planner and supervising architect for a number of important Long Island based projects, including the World's Fairs of 1939 and 1964 in Flushing, Queens, and LaGuardia and uh, Little Wild, now John F. K. Airports. Here was the man, an intense and interesting man uh, who loved to smoke. You wouldn't see too many North American architects smoking, nor too many architects with a, with a tie so short as he was wearing it at that time, I guess, was fashionable, as opposed to what uh, President Trump uh, used to sport uh, a very long uh, tie. Uh, anyway, here they are, you know, talking about the, um, the United Nations building on the left, Le Corbusier. Um, here is uh, Oscar Niemeyer. In the back is actually Wallace Harrison. This one looks like Abramovitz. This one is Abramovitz, yes. So, uh, you know, he was here. Mianne Le Corbusier and Oscar Niemeyer, and uh, I, I have difficulties to recognize any other people besides Wallace Harrison, hidden behind, but he was the director. Rockefeller Center, part of the Associated Architects, 1931-1971, an incredible uh, North American effort. And, uh, you know, showing the brilliance of, uh, of, of management, of engineering, and even aesthetically, I think this is a symbol of, uh, of a powerful uh, uh, North America. Very powerful. So Wallace Harrison, together with Max Abramovitz were involved. The United Nations building, uh, this is actually uh, that, that picture that we looked at uh, was in relation with building this building. The Corbusier was rather sour because uh, you know, he felt that some of his idea were kind of, the ideas were kind of stolen, uh, but he was consulted. On the other hand, there are also, ideas of Oscar Niemeyer that are present in this, um, you know, particular building in, uh, in New York City. Here you see the, uh, the Chrysler building and the Empire State Building, you know, the, and in between them, the, the United Nations building. Here again, we see in, in the back, uh, you know, the Empire State Building and here the Chrysler Building. And this is, of course, the United Nations building that was built by, uh, I mean, uh, Harrison Abramovich were, you know, in, in the leading uh, part of the group that designed it. Here we see uh, on the far right, the Panam building by Walter Gropius. So this is the United Nations building and uh, the site where it was built before the building started, um, you know, uh, risky job there, no? I mean, considering uh, the height, I, I read that actually at a certain height or beyond a certain height, only North American native Indians would be able to work. Uh, the white man would not do it. And I, I could understand why, just looking at the picture and I get dizzy. Anyway, we know, we know about the United Nations building. That's where they debate now about Ukraine and about COVID and about all kinds of issues. So again, Max Abramovitz and Wallace Harrison uh, were involved and in an, an important way, the Great Hall of New York futuristic as it is medieval. This one I love, this work. And I don't know, uh, in, in, some, in some materials, I found out that um, Max Abramovitz might be the author, 
They were together, Harrison Abramovitz, but it's a very interesting work, indeed futuristic as it is medieval. It's this one here, and uh, look at it from the top. An interesting work, indeed. Uh, you know, and uh, yes, you can take interesting, engaging pictures, both outside and inside. And it's it's it has a, you know it's it's not a rationalistic building you know as you might expect for the whole of science. I don't know if they designed this one as well or if it was built later, but this one behind was designed by them. It's like a fortress, like a citadel, but as a, a, an ornamented citadel, and that's what makes it, uh, you know, rather interesting. You know, the, those walls, although they are massive, uh, because of the, the undulations, the, the fluidity, but also because of the, the ornamental design, become less heavy and more friendly and more interesting and in a way more feminine. I like this work very much by them. Harrison Abramovitz. And here we can see clearly the value, the importance of ornament, that we have the structure for all to see, but we also have the ornament for all to see. And they come together. And it's good that they come together. And you see each panel is a little bit different. Is you know, is, they are done in the same way, but they are all different. And this creates variety uh, on the elevation. Now, this one is uh, one of the most mysterious works, in my opinion, built in the 20th century. And apparently only today I found out that there was a third partner at the beginning, but he died at 65, a Frenchman. Uh, I hope I have his name here. Apparently he designed it, but they were, he was part of the team of the same firm, Harrison, and then the name of the Frenchman, and then, uh, 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 Max Abramovitz. This is the work. And with this, I have a particular uh, personal story uh, connected. Uh, I, I don't know if I have here that material to talk. I, I presented it in the past, but it, it is a very interesting work in my opinion. And they became the symbols of New York City. Uh, um, you know, a, a futuristic uh, mega work this was built for the uh, World's Fair in 1939 in New York City, in Queens. And look at the scale, look at the scale of this sphere. The, you know, the uh, trilon is here, the, the tall uh, triangular pyramids, pyramid, and this is the perisphere. And the people staying in line, look, look here, you know, all willing to enter the big sphere or the perisphere built by Harrison Abramovitz and their French partner host name, but I hope I have here a drawing where his name is shown. That's what they built. And it's just, uh, I think it's stunning, you know, considering 1939. And from the top, you could, uh, you know, contemplate the, the Futurama, you, the, the future of the world. Of course, the future of the world being without uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the war that is waged now um, complicates matters uh, violently. So this is the Trilon and the Perisphere in, uh, in New York City. It's non, not in Manhattan, but in Queens from 1939, the World's Fair, and built by Harrison Abramovitz. And this is the name of the other architect at the bottom, Andre Fuyu. He was a member, you know, it's interesting that he's written, uh, you know, he's mentioned the word inventors, not creators. But I read that actually he, the Frenchman kind of was the author of this, but he was part of the firm. In 1939, Abramovitz was not yet working with, with Harrison. He, he began to work there in 1941, so two years later. But this is a very interesting work, and uh, I hope I don't have here a project I did very similar to this one without even knowing about this, uh, this work. 
look at, uh, you know, <laughs> the trilon and the perisphere made them, made it even on the, on the caps of women, you know, in fashion, they became the symbol of, sim symbols of New York City. You see, New York World's Fair, 1939. On a stamp, of course. It was about the future. They were dreaming about the future. Unfortunately, the, the Second World War didn't start much, much later. And then uh, not much later either, the two atomic uh, bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is a project I did, but I will not insist now on it because I, I, I presented it before where I, I kind of, but believe me, I didn't know anything about that project. It was, I think, some kind of a, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I rediscovered the wheel in a way, but I placed them in the Times Square you know, a uh, uh, tower, but I, I, I don't know what to do. No, I better not explain it because it's, 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 it requires a little bit of work. I mean, I don't mind, it's just that I don't want to. Okay, I, I'll say it. So I, I took part in this competition for um, 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 that, you know, the crossroads of the world in the middle of Manhattan where Broadway and 7th Avenue intersect. And uh, the comp competition asked for a tower for Times Tower, which is an existing tower, was an existing tower here. But I proposed two towers because uh, uh, the symmetry of the site plan uh, made me do so. So I proposed a red tower and the white tower. And the 45th Street, halfway between the white tower and the red tower, is the so-called the crossroads of the world where Broadway and 7th Avenue intersect. And inspired by the hourglass shape of the plan, I, 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 I imagine these two towers, one symbolizing uh, the sun, uh, the king, fire, and the other one symbolizing the moon, meaning the white, the queen, and, uh, and water. So we have fire and water, the king and the queen the sun and the moon, because this is at north, as you can see, and north, and this is at south. So I saw these two poles, these two dichotomical forces could explain in a way the, the incredible drama at Times Square in, in Manhattan. And if you projected them horizontally, they would meet actually exactly at 45th Street, where the intersection between Broadway and, and 7th Avenue took place. And in front of, the, of two towers, I imagine two giant uh, urban thrones or chairs on the white one sitting the red king, on the red one sitting the white queen, but they were so big because you could have walked underneath the seat on which the red king sat. So, you know, it was this, this kind of thinking influenced as I was by psychology and alchemy by Carl Jung at that time. Okay, now you see, but, but it's true, the, the resemblance to the uh, trilon and the perisphere of Harrison Abramovitz is striking, but I need to know anything. Uh, in fact, I just arrived in New York at that time. I knew nothing about that project. And it was a Japanese man in the office I worked. When he saw the project, he said, uh, the, you know, this is very similar to the trilon and the uh, perisphere that uh, uh, were built in 1939 and that were the symbols of New York City. I knew nothing. It was a coincidence or uh, what could I say? The Hopkins Center for the Arts at Dartmouth College, also uh, Harrison Abramovitz, they built a lot. Uh, and uh, some of their buildings I think are, are still uh, uh, remarkable. So although Max Abramovitz uh, designed, you know, uh, specifically certain buildings them himself, I'm sure since the works were produced, 
by the firm, Harrison and Abramovich, that, uh, you know, uh, Wallace Harrison uh, also uh, agreed with what Abramovich did and vice versa. They, they were partners in the same firm. The Metropolitan Opera House at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, a very important building in New York City, also built by Harrison Abramovich, Max Abramovich. They were good. They were good. I mean, look, look, just at this staircase. You know, uh, it, it, it's it's very well done. And uh, this was before you know the facilities of digital, uh, uh, you know, technology. So again, these works were done by the firm of Harrison Abramovich. Maybe, maybe the, the, the input by Harrison, by Wallace Harrison was uh, a little bigger in these works, but I don't know. Rockefeller Apartments, New York City. They built everything, houses, uh, you know, private houses, uh, apartment buildings, uh, museums. This work, this work, the Fish Church is excellent. And uh, it's so much, uh, uh, you know, it's so good that even uh, Rem Kolhas uh, uh, applauded it in his book uh, about delirious New York. And he, by the way, Rem Kolhas is very fond of the firm of Wallace Harrison, uh, Max Abramovich. He truly admired their works. So the Fish Church is an excellent building by them. Um, it is, it is beautiful. It is geometrical, it is triangular, it is Gothic, it is modern. It is a uh, creative work. I wish I had uh, better pictures, but anyway, the stained glass windows are also narrative, but uh, they are modern artworks. And uh, you can, of course, find more information uh, on the web about any of these works. Here is just an ad memoir of their uh, accomplishments. And it's, it's, it's a great church, a great church, which makes me very, very unhappy when I think about the churches being built in our country which are not creative at all. It's a shame. So the Fish Church in Stamford, Connecticut, built by Harrison Abramovich. Here is, is Mr. Wallace Harrison, uh, you know, in an artsy posturing, good for him. I love these people, you know, who, who, you know, uh, like you see here, you know, he's drawing like an artist, not like a, not like an architect, you know, freehand and, uh, you know, but uh, we need this, we need vision, we need nerve, we need uh, uh, vigor and uh, vision, yes, and he had them, he had them and the building is good, it's very, very good, the fish church by Harrison Abramovich, the Sophronia Brooks Hall in Berlin. This is interesting too, I would say, you know, it's uh, austere kind of, but it has this uh, uh, mysterious um, curved wall at the entrance, which makes it uh, enticing and interesting. Harrison Abramovich, the tower, this tower in Cleveland, Ohio. We already saw some towers by Max Abramovitz, but they might have been equally uh, by uh, Wallace Harrison. Again, they were built by Harrison Abramovitz. This one we saw. I ended the presentation on Max Abramovitz um, with this work. 
At that time, when I made this presentation, I first made it on Wallace Harrison. I didn't know that um, Max Abramovitz actually, apparently, he designed it. I think they worked together. They designed it together. It, it was the work of their firm, after all. The Empire State Plaza, now, from what I read, when Wallace Harrison received this very big and important uh, commission in Albany, Albany being uh, the, the political administrative uh, uh, capital of the state of New York. It's not New York, it's Albany. And this is the, you know, the, the seat of, of power, administrative and so on, uh, the Empire State Plaza. When, when Wallace Harrison received this commission, Wallace Harrison began to work exclusively or preponderantly on this work while the other commissions went to Max Abramovitz. And uh, this happened for, I don't know, around 15 years or so. And all of this was built by them. On, in, uh, on some websites, I read that actually this museum uh, was uh, the Museum of the State of New York was built was designed actually by uh, Max Abramovitz. I don't know, but all in all, they designed together, they created together, they made the project for the political administrative, uh, administrative uh, center of the state of New York together, Harrison and Abramovitz. And uh, we see some echoes here coming from uh, Manhattan, from Rockefeller Center. We can see also a work which uh, Constantin Brunkush uh, uh, happy, happy birthday to you, or happy, uh, how to say, La Mulzani for yesterday, no, as um, Svintul Constantin. I, I wanted to make a presentation about Constantin and architecture, no one showed up. Um, so this is also very interesting, and uh, the, you, you will see it in detail. Harrison Abramovitz, Alba, Alban in New York, the egg. Uh, the beginning of the world, to use uh, the name of a sculpture by uh, Constantin Brunkush. Here it is, a section three, <clears throat> and it was built. It was built. So, you know, when you have a vision and when you, ha you, you have a, a family rel a relative, like, uh, you know, the, uh, one of the Rockefellers, uh, it, it helps. It was built. It was built and it was built perfectly and it's vigorous, it's mysterious, and it's a governmental building. Not bad. The egg in Albany, the state of New York. Upstate New York is actually Albany. So all of these were, had been, um, well, this building now, nor this building, but the, those that you saw in that view from the, the air were built by Harrison and Abramovitz, Max Abramovitz. Born in Chicago on the 23rd of May, 2000, uh, 1, 1, 1, from Romanian immigrant uh, Jews. Bravo to him. So they built this, these four towers, this one, the egg, and this uh, museum of the state of New York, and the plaza, of course, all the space, and I guess these buildings as well. It's almost utopian. No, I'm sorry. This is the, the Museum of uh, the State of New York. I don't know what this is. That's it. So again, happy birthday, Max Abramovich, and, uh, and uh, congratulations to both Wallace Harrison and Max Abramovich for their works. <clears throat>